שלום everyone, and uh, this week we're studying Parashat Azriah. Uh, Parashat Azriah, this is uh, the book of Leviticus, chapter 12, verse 1, and we have to remember the framework of what we are doing. So again, because it looks like people are forgetting and we need, that's our job to remind. Genesis is uh, the beginning of the year, and we're talking about the year cycle of our spiritual journey. Another cycle, another uh, coming up, another step in our spiritual growth. And we want to get the best out of every cycle like this. So it's going to be a spiral and not just uh, looking for something without any connections. So Genesis was always reestablishing the basic and reenacting the best basic uh, rules of spiritual work. Uh, Exodus, the book of Exodus is about uh, beginning and creating a fight for redemption every year again and again, every year from our own demons, negativities, uh, addictions and stuff like this. And immediately when we stop the book, when we finish the book of Exodus, Shemot, then we go into the book of Leviticus, which is about uh, fine-tuning our journey. And that means in the first parasha of the book of Vaikra, Leviticus, it was about, Vaikra means the calling, it was about uh, refining, retuning our own individual calling. Every human being has a calling. Now, the point is, if I don't know where I'm going to, what are the chances that I'm going to make it? And of course, whoever learned about goal settings, if you, know, if you don't know where you're going to, your chances of getting there are not so high. So the fine tuning every year, the fine tuning of my goal settings uh, is, is crucial in, be, in order to be able to get the best out of this part of the year or the whole year, this part of my life. The second parasha, parasha tzav, uh, that was about, uh, about the energy and how can you fine tune yourself without having always that, uh, that flame of excitement that always have to be tuned that is going to be positive and not negative. So always to be loving, kindness, excitement that the chesed is overcoming the fire excitement, that when the fire excitement is overcoming the uh, chesed excitement, then we have anger, hatred, and all kinds of inflammations that basically blocks uh, our, our movement forward. Then we had last week, we had Parashat Shmini, which was about retuning ourselves outside the box and outside the box connection. And especially finding the, the, the connection between connecting to the spiritual dimension, which is being called number eight, which means the eighth direction that has to be coming from a place of spiritual vision, has to come from a place of selfless and uh, uh, nature and running away from our egoism and selfishness. So that was last week. Parashat Tazriya gives us another layer for that tune-up that we go through, through the whole book of Leviticus. And especially the parasha, those parashot are always around Passover in which we have a very strong connection in Passover that is in the spring. Everybody heard about spring cleaning. So it's not just a physical cleaning, we're talking, we're talking about the mental cleaning in order to be able to see the enlightenment. Okay, so Parashat Tazriya, the name of the Parashat Tazriya is, is very disputed, but the Shorish, okay, the very disputed, what's, what does it mean? You, you ask anyone who studies Torah, okay, and you ask him, give me a, a translation into English of the word Tazria. 
in this parasha. Isha ki tazria, a woman that will give sperm. Women, women do not give sperm. Forget it. So what is this parasha about? The shoresh of the word tazria is zera, semen, sperm, seed. Okay, what is that to do, has that to do with our lives? And we learned it in previous parasha. Uh, if you notice, it's also speaking in the first uh, uh, in the first verses, first of all, the second verse is about the woman that gives sperm, and we know women do not give the sperm, and it's not that the Torah did not know that, but we have to understand what, what's in it for us, okay? And then on the third verse, it says, and on the eighth day, by Yom Hashmini, which brings back again the name of the previous parasha, by Yom Hashmini, that was exactly the name of the parasha we just read. By Yom Hashmini, on the eighth day, Yimol Besar Olato, that will be the day of circumcision. Okay, so what do we get out of it? So we learned in previous years, I'm not going to repeat it too much, uh, but it, this is like really, really important uh, message. And I'm reading again, Parashat uh, Tazria in the Zohar, verse number nine. Isha ki Tazria, Taneinan, Isha mazra atchila yoledet zachar. Rabbi Yacha amar, ha Taneinan, dekutsha bechu gazar alai tipa. I hi u zachar, I hi nekeva. Ve'at amat Isha mazra atchila yoledet zachar. Amar Rabbi Yosei, vaday kutsha bechu avchid ben tipa de tchura ben tipa de nukba, uvegin de avchin lei, Translation, we learn that when a woman gives the semen first, then she'll give birth to a baby boy, okay? Uh, we all know there's a problem with this, with this verse. So Rabbi Abba Echa is saying, but we learn that God is the one who decides if that's, that pregnancy is going to uh, come out with a male or female, it's God's decision. And you're saying a woman that will give sperm first will bring a baby boy? What, is, what, what, what does it mean? So we don't need God to interfere. Amar Rabbi Yossi, so Rabbi Yossi is answering. Of course, God can tell the difference between a sperm of a male and a sperm of a female. Uh, we know today what they're talking about. If it is, today we know, if it's, a, if it's a sperm cell that has a Y chromosome, that will be a male. If it is an X chromosome of the male sperm cell, that's going to be a female, okay? And the Zohar says it clearly. A sperm cell can, can be a one for a male, a one for a female. And God knows exactly which one is which, okay? So the question is going back again. So who decides which, what, what, which, which gender, gender will be of the boy or the girl? Is it going to be a boy or a girl? But the Zohar goes on in saying, we are not just talking about whether it's a boy or a girl. We are talking about something much better than that. The question is not just if it is a boy or a girl, what determines what kind of a soul will come to that pregnancy? Okay, and here the Zohar comes with an amazing description. Okay, and it says as follows. Uh, verse 14. And by, by the way, again, what the Zohar is saying, and I discussed it a lot in the previous years, but this is what the Zohar is saying is God is the, um, the uh, particip participant in the making of a child that whoever the major forces are coming from the father and the mother. And whatever the father and the mother create down in the physical world, God agrees or do not agree from the upper world. And we know, not, you know, medical science cannot give us a clear answer how come you have sometimes 
fertile man and a fertile woman trying to get pregnancy and they're incapable of doing that. And only after many years, it comes out as uh, a child, as a pregnancy. Why? And why is it that sometimes science is saying this male, this female can never get together to get pregnancy. And well, here's as a child coming out. So science is still a little bit limited about all the conditions that are being needed because we know life is not math. Real life cannot go with math. You can have like general statistics, but when we're talking about like real individual occasions, science cannot give us a real explanation or a prediction of how things will come out not when we are talking about a biological uh, process, which means fertilization, pregnant, uh, pregnancy, and so on, there are so, when there are so many uh, forces, powers, chemicals, whatever you name it, that are involved, it's not just like uh, one plus one equals two. That, that is good on the on, on a page when you write an equation. But when it comes to life, it doesn't work this way. And the Zohar is asking, so what, how can we affect that process? And a lot of people use it into a very simplistic thing, which means in many, many, many places, in many, many families, many, many people, they want to control the gender of the child that will be born, which means traditionally, you know, most people, along the generations, they wanted more. Still today, there are families like this all over the world. They prefer to have a male boy and not a female a, a daughter, girl. And they'll do anything. And they try to find from here, what is the uh, special trick I should do to have a boy? But this is not what, what we are talking about. It, or about it. Let's move on. And it says on verse 14, come and see. When a man comes to sanctify himself and unite with his female, with the holy will, then he can bring from above a holy spirit that is included of a male and a female. And he hints by that, 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 and he And he says, it's hinting about, there's an angel, that when there's a supposed to be pregnancy, which means not every time two fertile people have a, a sexual intercourse and both are fertile, okay, and they're not using anything, to uh, prevent pregnancy. Not every time you have pregnancy. And, that, and why? Because, because God needs to decide that there's going to be a pregnancy. He gives the order to that angel, says the Zohar, and he hands over that spirit that is going to come into that child and he hands it over to that angel, okay? And he tells him where to go. And that, that's why it says in the book of Job, Okay, I don't want to go into this because I spoke about it before. As Then comes that spirit down, that soul that is supposed to come into that uh, child, into that baby. And he comes with that, what is called Selem. Selem? Uh, Tselem is an image, okay? But it's much more than an image and we'll see what does it mean. Oto Tselem haomet betzura zo shel mala and it's called godly Tselem. But Tselem hazeh hu nivra and the child cannot come in without that Tselem. But Tselem hazeh olech baolam hazeh and even after birth, without that Tselem, the person cannot live. As it says, Ach uh, 
Psalms 39, and whoever wants to learn more about it, there's a lot, big discussion about it in my lecture about the, that topic in the lecture of Hoshana Rabba, and you can look for it uh, on YouTube. Okay? When a person loses his Tzelem, he will die because the soul cannot uh, give life to the physical body without the connection that the Tzelem is giving between the soul and the body. Okay? Uh, I won't continue with that, but I would like to, uh, to try to bring it to what, how is that connection to uh, our, our parasha? Because what if I'm not planning to bring a child to the world, okay? What if I do plan to bring a child to the world? Does that, does that have anything to do with my, my journey? As we said, this is the fourth parasha of the book of, uh, the book of uh, Leviticus. And what is the connection? And here it is, we're going back to the root of the word Isha Kitazria, a woman that will bring sperm, okay, seed. And a woman means the soul, our soul. We are all female. We are all vessels, okay? And giving a seed, planting a seed, that's what we're talking about. Why? The Zohar is explaining to, explaining to us something very important. And he says as follows. Uh, we'll read just verse... Uh, Okay, the Zohar says something like this. The moment a couple, a man and a woman, the moment they have an intercourse and it comes to the peak, to the climax, and that moment, there is an emotional projection that comes from the couple. That projection, joining it together, and the Rizal speaks about it in more details in the book, the gate of reincarnation. The energy, the thoughts, the emotions that happen in that specific moment create kind of a projection of a mental, spiritual image, okay? If there is a soul that fits that image, that soul is being given to the angel, that bring that soul into the pregnancy. However, the soul won't, would not come in to the fetus till 40 days later. So who is there to guarantee that the fertilization will happen and the pregnancy will take place till the 40th day? This is what is called the Tzelem. What is that Tzelem? If there is going to be a pregnancy, the thoughts and the emotions of the couple join and create a new entity. It's like a mini soul. That entity, that entity is what we call the Tzelem. It's a force, it's a mini spirit, the death mini spirit guarantees that the right sperm cell that has the right combination of genes and chromosomes will fertilize the egg. So the child that will come out of it will have the right genetical uh, bank that will support, support the person that will grow out of that pregnancy. Now, which means who determines if what kind of a child will come out, if there is going to be a child coming out of this uh, union? This, this is the thoughts, the emotions, 
that the parents generate on that special moment. Okay? Now, that person, that selling will stay there, guarantee the beginning of the pregnancy, even after the 40 days, as we said, the Zohar teaches us that Selim, that mini spirit, is something on the border between physical and spiritual. It was created on that moment by the couple. That will continue to be there because that will be the interface that connects between the human soul and the body that was also created from the two parents, okay? As long that Selem is there, the person will continue to live. However, the Zohar is teaching us 30 days before the person dies, that Selem would leave. And we won't go into uh, why would it happen. And so after the Selem leaves, the soul can reside next to the body only for 30 more days. And after 30 days, the soul must leave and that will result in a physical death. Okay? So that's why it says, Ach and again, if you want to go to the details, that is in my lecture on Oshana Rabbah a few months, uh, almost six months ago. And you can find it on YouTube. Now, how is that connected to what we just said? So the Zohar continues. Verse 18. It is really, really like the word asur translated wrongly from Hebrew into the word forbidden. It's not. Asu means limiting, like somebody that is uh, jailed. It's the same word in Hebrew. Somebody is jailed, that's asu, which means when a person is angry and is throwing things in his anger, okay, while is he is basically giving away his life force to the dark side, okay? So first of all, it is a soul, very limiting to be angry because when we're angry, we like go voluntarily into a jail of negative energy that we create that jail. That jail. And if we throw things when in our anger, that's even more dangerous. Okay, and we're not, you know, you're not supposed to do that. There are so many negative forces that the moment people do that, they basically, through the anger, invite dark forces into their own lives. And more than that, and from that moment on, even if the person already has some bliss and good fortune in his life, he's losing it because he changed his vessel by connecting his vessel, his soul and his selim, says Azor, to the dark side by allowing anger to take over. And of course, whoever does that purposely, you know, you summon in as we learn in Parashat Vayikra, you have to call in holiness. But if you call in dark forces, that's horrible, but people do that, okay? Because you damage your tselem. Remember that tselem is that interface, okay? Because you bring it over. Now, why is that important? Because that means something very, very crucial. The Zohar is speaking, uh, when we go, uh, uh, the, con the Zohar is connecting that to the other parts of this parasha, because the parasha, only the beginning of it, chapter 12 in Leviticus, it's talking about 
the birth of a child, if it's a boy or a girl, uh, the whole thing about circumcision, and if it's a girl, and how you know what happens to the to the uh, lady who gave birth and stuff like this. And then chapter 13, it speaks another topic. And the topic is about leprosy and all the rules of leprosy. And we're not talking about the medical um, uh, ailment that is called today by medical science, leprosy, because if you read the book in Parashat Azria, with all the definition of what leprosy is about, leprosy is not about a physical disease. It is a mental disease that only the Kohen, the high priest, not a physician, can diagnose. And he's the only one who can heal that disease. Okay? So the whole thing about the leprosy, the identification of it, the diagnosal of a of this and the healing of it, all of it is connected to the Kohen. And what is the Kohen about? The Kohen is about loving kindness. It's the energy of chesed. So if you want to heal leprosy, you have to heal it with chesed. So what is leprosy about? So, this, so, the, so, all lep so let's go to the commentary. So as we said before, uh, chapter 13, Verse, verse one. Uh, so if we go to uh, to the different uh, commentaries, uh, let us see uh, the Zohar commentary about leprosy. There are many articles about it, but uh, uh, okay. Verse 17, the Zohar Parashat Tazriya. Ad Azlai, Malian Vanpo Imalian Amar Man Ani, Amar Lo Amar Hachi, Translation. Uh, we're talking about two uh, sages walking on the road and they meet that person that his face is full of all kinds of blemishes. And he's sitting under one uh, tree. They look at him and they see that his face is in inflamed with all of these blemishes. So Rabbi Chia says to him, who are you? He says, I'm a Jew. I said, Amar, so Rabbi Yossi said, he is a sinner because if he, he would not be a sinner, he won't have those blemishes impressed on his face because when it is pain of love, which means everybody makes mistakes and everybody's a sinner, we all sin, we human beings. But when we sin by mistake or by, uh, you know, we just said a moment that we just, what happens? We did something wrong. Okay, we are people, people do that. But we are taking responsibility for these sins. We're trying all the time either not to fall into them. And when we fell into them, we, we're getting up. The, the punishment and the results of those sins won't be revealed to the public. The moment they are being revealed to the public, it means that we are totally not in the frame of pain of love. What does it mean pain of love? Yisurin of, of Shalava. It means that uh, pain of love means that the person is, is struggling to become better. We're not here to be perfect, but we're trying to perfect. When a person is Focusing on that, falling and getting up, falling and getting up. Remember that uh, verse from uh, from uh, Proverbs by King Solomon: "Sheva ipol tzadik vekam." A righteous person will fall seven times and rise up. Which means righteous people are not people that 
never make mistakes. These are people that fall and get up all over again. They never give up on trying to be better. Yagato, matzata tamin, you try hard, finally you'll get it. Okay? But these are pains of love, which means you love God, God loves you, and, and nobody has to see all the struggles that you go through. But the moment you give up, you fall and you don't get up. And you're more than that. You blame the whole world. You're angry about the whole world. You give up on trying. You decide that it's better to be an evil person. And you acknowledge that consciously or subconsciously. Then you start to have suffering that are not love. Because you're not in love with God. And God is away from you. Then you start to see other kinds of suffering that you'll see in public. Now, how is that connected? We are talking about something that is very important. The same way that when a couple get together and they have a union and their thoughts of that moment will be, plant, will be the seed for the life of a no human being, that thought is so powerful that it will be the interface, the celeb that connects that child's soul that is eternal with his body, which is not internal, eternal, right? It is mortal. But what connects between the eternal and the mortal is the energy, the force that was generated by the thoughts and the hearts of the parents. Now, what happens to that celeb when the person passes on. Remember, he leaves him 30 days before death. But that Selim stays in the bones in the grave. Which means when a person dies, his soul goes on. What's in the grave? Why do we go to the cemetery? What's in there? Just the bones. The soul is incarnated went to heaven, went to who knows where. The soul does not stay in the grave. So who is there in the grave? The Selim that the parents created. So you go to somebody's grave and who is there in the bones? That power that was generated by the parents of the persons buried there. And that means that we could, you know, that can be there for thousands of years. So when we are talking about the power of the mind, the thoughts, and here we have a thought that, that will be resulted in something that will stay for thousands of years, correct? Now, that's about teaching us how to plant seeds. We have moments of free will. Nobody is telling us when those moments happen, but they happen all day long. Those moments are the moments that we react, the moments that we think we make a choice about wanting something, desiring something, getting an opinion about something, okay? Criticizing something or having a, a lust, a desire, a craving for something. All of those emotions and thoughts, we cannot choose them, but we can choose how to react to them. So the whole parasha is talking about purity and impurity. When a person is in a constant journey of purifying themselves, then we'll be on guard most of the time it's very hard to be, almost impossible to be on guard all the time. But the moment we have that commitment to be on guard, we are starting to witness our emotions and our reactions. Okay? And that means that we have to take the oath daily that when those thoughts and emotions are coming, to take responsibility for them. And because the way we react to them, that creates a seed for the rest of our lives. It's not going to be that crucial 
as bringing a child to the world, but it is still crucial because that will be the birth of my future. You know what they say, today is the first day of the rest of your life. But how would the rest of my life would look like? Depends on the choices I'm going to make today. And when, say, when our sages are saying the ethics of the fathers, hakol bidei shamayim, chutz mirat shamayim, everything is in the hands of heavens, except from the awe of heavens, which means the more I work on the awe, what is awe? Awe, A-W-E, is the source of the word awareness, okay? The more aware I am, to my choices, as it says before, if I choose to get angry, if I choose to get upset, if I choose to become critical on somebody else, if the moment I choose, and that moment I chose a destiny, a destiny with less blessings, a destiny with less light, a destiny with more darkness, I'm inviting the dark side into my life, and that dark side will leave only when I choose the light side, which means those moments, I need to be aware on guard because those moments are the moments that I'm planting the seeds of tomorrow and the day after. And this is where we are talking about. Do you want to have control over your destiny? You want to have control over your life. Of course, you can't control in the sense of who do you want to be and what do you want to be and where you're going to be. You have no control over that. Forget about, about it. Thank God that we don't. Because, you know, the dreams that we have today, we see later on, a year, two years later, thank God that I didn't get what my, I wished for because my brain was in a totally different thing. But if I really want to get the best of my potential, I have to focus on my awareness that it will be pure. How do I purify my awareness? This is what the Zohar is talking about. And the Zohar is talking about sanctifying. Sanctifying, holy, ho choosing the holiness, and choosing what is right and what is pure. How do we do that? We have to train our brain and our hearts into choosing purity, okay? And the whole book of Leviticus is about that, which means how do I have more chances to choose light over darkness, purity, over negativity, because that is basically when I choose a future full of light or a future with a lot of negative forces to overcome. Those are my choices. So when we read the Zohar, and the Zohar is teaching us a lot about, first of all, how to manage anger, how to manage all of those impure thoughts. And what does it mean, impure thoughts? Every thought that is, or every emotion that is, uh, by the definition of Rabbi Ashlag, desire to receive for the self alone, okay, that is a shutdown. That is shutting the light down, and that means inviting the dark side in. And it comes with the territory. It's a, it's a package deal. The moment we choose an angel, a thought, a force of negativity, of selfishness, that that's a seed. We plant a seed of selfishness that will come out as anger, lust, uh, all of those emotions that are our enemies. That means choosing the dark side. And that means that God will put in that choice the right uh, destiny, the right movie that will lead me through the trials and errors, trials and tribulations that finally will force me, who knows how long would it take, will force me 
to let go of my choices. So when somebody is wondering, oh God, why do you hate me? Why did you give me all of those uh, trying moments? It's not that God hates us. He, he does not. We chose those movies by inviting them the moment we chose to plant a seed that is a seed of anger, hatred, blame, uh, lust, and all kinds of other selfish emotions and desires and justifications. So how do we purify ourselves? So we go again, the story of pregnancy. How do you purify yourself if you want to bring a soul that is pure? So the Torah is teaching us, you need, first of all, to purify yourself with water. That's a mikveh. Okay, you have also to prepare yourself that when you come into a union like this that can be involved 100% in physical lust and bodily arousal of selfishness, no, you have to teach yourself, to train yourself, to prepare yourself to be there for somebody else especially for your partner and think first about your partner before that, before thinking about yourself. Okay. So that's called to sanctify that the couple sanctify themselves. And Rabbi Isaac Luria is giving the details. When the two parents sanctify themselves, the higher is their trial and effort, the higher is the soul that is being drawn in. Okay. And that is connected to their effort. Now, the same thing, it's not just bringing a child to my life, bringing a, a destiny that is my life, that is what's going to be my future in the days to come, which means what am I going to go through? How am I going to see the world around me? What kind of decisions I'm going to make? That's already part of that movie. How do I purify my brain? So we learn in the book of Leviticus, the more I commit to love other people, that means that I'm transforming my desire to receive for the self alone, my selfishness, that selfishness creates anger. You know, when a person is humble and positive and loving and enlightened, the chances he's going to fall into a rage and anger and throw stuff are very low. That doesn't happen in a minute. It's a lifetime process and effort. When a person is making sure to purify himself, either with the physical uh, purification of water, like mikveh, dipping in rainwater, spring water, ocean water, stuff like this, lake water, any kinds of water, and the same thing, what is water? Chesed, which means engulfing ourselves with actions of chesed. That's also a mikveh. And also studying positive thinking, especially studying the Zohar for not knowing more stuff and how to do magic, but studying the Zohar or the Talmud or just the Torah, but studying that in order to purify our emotions and our nature and making ourselves more, more giving, sharing. And also, whenever negative thoughts are coming in to our minds and our hearts, when we train ourselves ongoingly with a commitment not to let those thoughts and emotions to take over, that's how I'm preparing myself. So when the moment is coming in the crucial moment that I'm basically choosing between one destiny or another destiny, which means, as I said, as I read from the Zohar, when we choose to invite the dark side by letting, allowing anger, blame, ego, all kinds of stuff to overcome my heart and my mind, I'm inviting in a destiny that is full of darkness that belongs to the dark side. What does that mean? Preferences, uh, loves, and you know, all of those, all of those choices that we make that we think we made the choice. It was not a choice. 
it was already a derivation, it was a derivative of our state of mind, of our negative awareness. And that's why, again, I'm mentioning a, a Dr. Uh, um, Kahneman who got a Nobel Prize in 2002 for proving, proving that when people make their most important decisions about investing money, about partnership, about buying or selling, it's not as a result of a logical process. It's from a gut feeling. Lately, he just printed a book that is called Noise, which he explains the emotional noise that is being generated. And that noise is what determines our choices, which means the moment we commit to fight the noise, to fight the anger, to fight all of those emotions that belong to the dark side, it, it's not that we cannot have those emotions. We have to go to those emotions because this is part of our tikkun. However, when we face those emotions, when we experience those emotions and we fight them and we fight them again, we, get, we fall and we get up. As King Solomon said, you fall seven times, but you get up. That's what makes a righteous person. What does it mean? You do not allow those emotions to settle. You, you do not invite them to stay with you. You do not justify them. And that means you push away the dark side from your system. That means that your mind and your heart are choosing the light. And when you choose the light, your brain and your heart will make different choices, okay? Of who to marry, what kind of business to do, with who to do this business, what to say. When, when we already make a choice, we like this or we like this, where do we live? Who do we make business? It's already a result. We think that we make a choice. No, we do not. We choose what we feel better about. Why do I feel better about A and not about B? Because my awareness, if my awareness is enlightened, my choices will be different because there's less noise. I will see reality in a different way. I will be guided to choose differently. I will choose stuff that will bring me into a destiny that is more full with light. However, when I choose darkness, I choose the anger, I choose being right over being the light. When I choose all of those um, emotions and thoughts of the dark side, I invite the dark side. And that will mean that I will start choosing, making like, I will have all justifications, logical justifications. Why did I, it's the right thing to choose. And I will choose stuff that will hurt me, will bring me into trials and tribulations. And I'll ask myself, why did I choose that stuff? How could I be such a fool? No, you're not a fool, you're dumb, which means you're blocked. It's like the word in Hebrew is metumtam. Metumtam in Hebrew, it's like, you know, you're dumb in English, but it doesn't mean metumtam is like that you're blocked. Why are you blocked? Because you eat, as we read in the previous parasha, you eat stuff that has dark energy into it. That's all the thing about eating the wrong food. For instance, like what the Torah is saying about meat that is coming from the wrong source that can make you dumb. The energy of the food, the way the food was prepared. That's why if you're not very spiritual, avoid eating meat. And everybody knows that if you have a dog and you, have that, you want that dog to be violent, so giving him meat, uncooked meat, full of blood, it will be more violent. So what do you think if you eat raw meat with a lot of blood that won't make you dumb? and more violent like your dog, 
Why do you want to be like your dog? Okay, so when you ask yourself, why some people are so helplessly violent, they think they can achieve stuff through violence, through hurting other people. It's because they are dumb. They are dumb because of consuming anger, negativity, hatred without any commitment to fight those emotions. So when you don't fight those emotions, what kind of seeds of destiny you plant? You plant seeds of dark destiny because you partner with the dark side. And what is a dark side? It's a lack of light. A lack of light means blindness. You choose stuff, everybody around you says like, how could you be so stupid? How could you see it's not serving your interest? How could people be motivated by rage and anger and jealousy? And the answer is, when you live a life, when you live a life that you're not, under, you're not taking responsibility for your awareness ongoingly, daily, every hour, every minute, as is sitting, teaching us, you're not working on sanctifying yourself. You're not working on positivity and love unconditionally. When you're not working on that, you, you make choices that you see the fruits of those seeds and those fruits are not really serving any purpose of having a good, prosperous, really positive life full of love and happiness. No, it's not. And you remember, it's your choice. So basically, this is what Parashat Azriya is about, is about the planting the seeds of our destiny. And that means taking responsibility, like a father and a mother who want to bring a child to the world. It's not just, it's a like Russian roulette bringing a child to the world. It's about commitment to love, to positivity. Otherwise, you'll pay for the rest of your life by bringing to the world children that their negativity is so obvious. Who is that? Where is that coming from? That's coming from the parents. That's what you invited when you brought the child to the world. And it's, but it's not, that's the point. Of it. It's not just about children. It's about every day of our life is a, re a result of choices we made before. It's not an intellectual choice. It's a mental, emotional choice that has to come from are we working all the time to connect to the eighth direction, to the godly side of our reality. If we do, we'll find ourselves making more and more choices that maybe are not very logical, but this, what will come out of these seeds will be fruitful with love, light, prosperity, and real, true, good life. Thank you so much and success.